Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. A letter from ESCOM indicating that it would not sign further contracts with IPPs until it had consultations with the Energy Minister sent shockwaves through the industry last week. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the fallout. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Did the letter come as a surprise and what is behind this? Well I think yes and no. I think it's been simmering and bursting into the public domain every now and then, mostly through quite hostile statements from the CEO of ESCOM, um, Brian Malefe, around renewable energy, saying he's described it as a fairly clumsy uh, technology. And I think he, he feels that when ESCOM needs it, which is during peak, uh, solar is not available and the wind might not be blowing. So he's, he's made his feelings quite uh, apparent. But I think it did come as a surprise still uh, that they've sent this letter and they want to sort of put a halt to any further signing of uh, power purchase agreements because there are a number of um, projects uh, in the mix at the moment. We've got, we've had four and a half rounds uh, of um, uh, the renewable energy program bid windows and uh, those have been procured about si over 6,000 megawatts of uh, renewable energy capacity. But then there was this expedited round of a further th 1,800 megawatts, which was really to mop up all the potential projects that just missed the cut earlier on in the first four and a half rounds, or four rounds, before we move on to a fifth bid window, which will come under a different framework where there might be a tightening up of rules around socioeconomic development or industrialization um, or black economic empowerment. So this was the, the final mop up. And then there was also these, these coal base load uh, bids that had been in and being evaluated for, no, for a long time now. For, uh, 2,500 megawatts is available. I think about 900 has been bid from two projects. And these, uh, the feeling was, are just about to be signed. So the fact that this came out now, uh, and this, uh, the chairman of ESCOM, uh, Dr. Ben Nagobani, saying that they only going to supply, uh, sign up to a window, bid window 4.5 of the renewable program means that some of these projects that are basically sitting, I think, at the DOE for signing before we can uh, move into a process of uh, getting to financial, well, preferred bidder and then going through a process of financial close, does leave those projects uh, some, some in a bit of limbo and it creates uncertainty around what has been so far a very successful uh, uh, program of attracting private investment into uh, South Africa's, uh, until recently, very constrained electricity mix. So we, you know, we had this uh, crisis which really st uh, came to the surface probably in 2006 when we had the cuts in the Western Cape. But really, uh, people talk about ground zero being uh, 2008 for the South Africa's electricity crisis. And we've had this um, constraint on the economy. Some suggest it's cut something, you know, shaved over one percentage point off our economic growth. So it's, it is a bit of a surprise that we're suddenly in a different environment, but we are. Um, so the, we do have a lot, we have this lower demand that has been coming through. So we've got demand now that is sort of, uh, uh, hasn't gone up since 2010. Uh, we've got, in fact, it's shrunk. Uh, we've got uh, a capacity that is now available from Eskom that wasn't there before in the form of higher plant availability from the coal-fired fleet. And that's added in the last year. If you took look at the first half of this year, the, uh, Eskom's year, uh, which was April to June or the first quarter, and you look at uh, the first quarter of last year, there's an additional power station, 3,700 megawatts available just through higher availability from Eskom's plant. Plus we've had the first units of Madupi coming in. So we suddenly are in a bit of a different environment on the supply side where we have a surplus for, for the first time in a number of years. Um, so I think it's a surprise, yes, in the way it came to the fore. It was a leaked letter, uh, but uh, these tensions have been simmering for some time. So I think they were eventually going to burst into the public domain. What is the potential fallout for South Africa and the IPPs? Well, we've had about 200 billion rands worth of private investment that's come into the renewable space already. We've got the coal base flow program, which will be a multi-billion rand uh, type of investment. Plus there was the expectation that end of the year or early next year we'd have a, a tender out for the gas to power program which would be probably a bundled uh, uh, tender where you'd, we need to build cap um, import capacity for uh, liquefied natural gas. That's the expectation because we don't really have re uh, nat uh, resources of gas 
domestically, so we'd have to base the gas to power program on something that was probably going to be LNG in the form of imports. So it would probably be a bundled approach where you build the import infrastructure and the terminal, as well as the gas, uh, power sta uh, gas, to, fire, uh, gas to power power stations uh, using that gas. And some of the gas might be used elsewhere um, directly, not, not in the form of power. So that was also the expectation. So all this, as I said, suggested earlier, is now up in the air. Eskom wants further consultations. They're making it clear that they don't feel they need this additional capacity, either in the form of renewables or even coal base load or even in the form of uh, gas to power. Others are saying that's a very short term view um, because, you know, we might be in a surplus position now, um, but we are really looking at um, uh, these projects, uh, as we've seen, they take time. You know, we first started to sign the renewables prog program projects in 2011. Those really only started to come in the mix in the last couple of years. The projects that we will sign now around coal and around renewables, uh, say post the bid window 4.5, are really only 2020-2021 type programs. We need to know, I suppose, um, what's going to happen beyond the, the, uh, beyond the time when Eskom needs to start retiring coal-fired fleets, whether those plants can be extended in some form or other, whether those extended plants will deliver the energy that their, their nameplate suggests or whether it would be below that. So there's a lot of unknowns. And I think one of the, uh, you know, I think it just raises a whole d a level of uncertainty that wasn't there a few months ago. But I think it is an uncertainty that was going to come because of the change in the demand supply uh, pattern. What do you think needs to be done to address the uncertainty? Well, the number one priority is that we need to get a handle on our integrated resource plan. At the moment, we've got an integrated resource plan that's six years out of date that should have been updated four years ago at least, and we should have had better visibility on a realistic demand uh, projection. At the moment, the, resor the integrated resource plan 2010, which was published in 2011, is really out of date in terms of the demand that was expected, and therefore, you know, the generation to match that demand, uh, that, you know, th those different technologies from coal, both from Eskom, uh, nuclear, the peaking plants, um, the renewables, all that uh, it might require a different pace of investment, a different scale, um, still probably needing all that capacity eventually, but it might, you know, we might be able to back in load. And really, we can, really we can see if there were to be a nuclear bidding process or uh, it's going to be closer to the 2030, post 2030 horizon before we see any of that capacity coming in. So we've already seen it naturally happen in the nuclear space, I suppose. Maybe there has to be a, a resequencing across the board and we need to be quite realistic. But what we also need to do is maintain the attractiveness of the South African market to attract power investments because eventually we're going to need it. We also, in a context where our region is power short. So it's not a situation where we can just tap into regional resources. Okay, there are plans to build uh, power in the region, but at the moment we're the biggest game in town. And in fact, the, you know, if we've got additional capacity, there is generally a, a market for that additional capacity domestically, but also in the region, if we can uh, you know, prioritize building the necessary transmission infrastructure. So I think um, being going back to a situation of deficit would be the worst case scenario. We have to stay in this sort of surplus scenario. We have to stay attractive both to the to the investment that Eskom is doing as well as to the private sector. And I think the third thing I think that might need to really happen is we need to have an independent view of Eskom's uh, plant availability and the longevity of that. There's definitely been a change. It was a 10 percentage point, I think, change from the first quarter, Eskom's first quarter last year to this year, we're seeing an av energy availability factor that's moved from the high 60 percent uh, to the high 70 percent during that uh, that period on period, and we now hear from Eskom in its statements that they've breached the 80 percent target already. So that does change things, and we need to know how they've got to that point. Um, and whether that is going to be sustained uh, into the future. If it is, and you add another five units at Madupi, six more units at Kusili, we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, capacity in this country. So we need to have visibility of that. And I think an independent audit is, is probably the way to go, to try and understand 
whether the existing coal-fired fleet is going to continue uh, operating at this level and for how long it can. And then also try and get a handle on, on demand as well as how, you know, whether we are able to extend the life of the coal-fired fleet or whether we're going to have to start retiring it in the mid-2020s. All those things I think we need to get a handle on. And I suppose the word we're really looking for and th what we really need in the energy sector now is leadership. And I think that's been absent for too long. And hopefully, we go hopefully this is a wake-up call, as, as some of we have called it, for engagement, a constructive engagement, and for leadership to emerge once and for all uh, um, around uh, giving us a roadmap for the way we're going to add generation capacity in this changed environment. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching, and join us again next time for more news analysis.